Good morning, everyone. I hope you have a chance to have uh, your teas or your coffees if you're not from the island. Uh, and uh, really excited to talk a little bit about content marketing and how you can measure the performance of your content marketing and what you need to do. Uh, first, please don't worry about taking too many notes. Uh, these slides will be, or they should already be uploaded to this uh, URL, so you can you can access them. There's another link at the end of the slides uh, if you don't manage to catch it now. So let's start with this. Why does it matter to to uh, measure your content ROI? Why should you even care about it? Isn't it just great to be putting out great content? You know, writing blog posts, producing white papers, ebooks, whatever, videos, you know, all that is content. Um, and you know, something that uh, you should always remember is that content marketing is not just about blogging or vlogging or, or producing any, any kind of, uh, of uh, content. It's, it's a business strategy that can help you grow your company and grow your business. So with that, you have to think strategically about it. You have to measure the performance in order to know what's going on and look for ways to improve it and make sure it's working for you. Uh, this is maybe because uh, I've always heard this attributed to Peter Drucker, who's a big American um, authority on management, but uh, apparently it's not 100% sure it's uh, the quote is by him. But, but it's a great quote, nevertheless. You know, you need to measure what you're doing. Otherwise, there's no way to manage it. Um, and just to let you know what we, we're going to cover today. Uh, so in the first part, I want to talk about how to make content part of your overall business strategy and how to align doing the report and measuring your pre performance with that. In the second part, um, I'll talk a little bit about how to set up a report. And I'll give you an example of one uh, customer I work with uh, and, and how we, I did it for them. And in the end, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how to actually calculate the return on investment of your content marketing efforts. But before that, just to tell you a bit more about myself, I consider myself a content marketer. Uh, I work with many SaaS companies, that's my main focus, but I've worked with companies from all different spaces and industries. Uh, I recently started curating a weekly newsletter on uh, content marketing, so if that's something you're interested in, I'll let you know how you can check it out. Uh, and you know, a fun fact, I love Southampton FC, if there are any football fans here in the room. I've been to games all over the country, actually. That's, you know, that's how dedicated I am. I've traveled all over the UK to watch the Saints. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, first, you know how to make part, uh, how to make content part of your overall strategy. It's really important to remember, you know, something that the, the thing that I started with that it's content is not just something that lives on its own. It should be part of your of how you organize and run your business, and it should serve the goals that you want to achieve for your business. Um, so think, str think strategically about those goals. Uh, you know, something that uh, I often get is that people want to get to generate traffic to their website, to their blog. And that really shouldn't be your, your uh, business goal because like, your goal is not to generate traffic. Your goal is to generate revenue. So traffic can be uh, uh, something that you strive towards as a performance indicator just to see how well you're doing, but it shouldn't be the, the end goal. Uh, and it, like, the goals for content can really depend on what you're going for with your business. So if you have uh, someone, maybe yourself, doing sales, uh, you know, the, the end goal of content can be generating leads. So that person who's doing sales can take the leads and turn them, you know, work towards getting them, uh, turning them into customers. Um, you know, I told you I work with a lot of SaaS companies and there the main goal for them is just to get people to start free trials because free trials is what generates revenue. You know, Customers who complete the free trial uh, become paying customers and that's where the revenue for SaaS companies is coming for, from. You know, when, when, when you have an idea about your goals, 
uh, it's important to come up with a framework of indicators that will let you track the performance on those goals. So, you know, you have to think uh, strategically about what metrics show progress on your goals. Um, you know, the, the most popular ones that I've seen in my practice, in my experience, is usually traffic or things like shares and comments. You know, when we're talking about traffic, lots of people uh, keep track of uh, organic traffic or traffic that comes from their SEO strategy, traffic that comes from Google and other search engines. Uh, shares and comments are always a good indicator of how engaged people are with your content. You might be getting a lot of um, visits on your website, but if people are not sharing that content and not commenting, that means that it probably doesn't uh, in engaging them as much. Uh, another good way to track uh, your content are the leads that you generate and, of course, the conver conversions, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, these two in the next part, how to set up your content report. So let's start with a few tools that you can use uh, to measure your content. Google Analytics is sort of straightforward. It's uh, grown over the years, so now it's a pretty complicated tool, but everyone knows it. It's free, it's easy to set up and to get started with. It's easy to integrate with WordPress. Um, Whoopera is uh, another tool which allows you for a very detailed uh, level of analytics. It has a free plan, uh, so you can also integrate it with WordPress in an easy way, and it, it's great. I'll, I'll show you in one of the following slides. It's great for creating funnels and really tracking what people are doing when you visit your website. Uh, Google Search Co Console is something that you should be using for measuring SEO. It's also a free tool. It integrates with analytics and all the other tools. And it's great just to see how you're doing in terms of SEO, what keywords you're ranking for, um, how many clicks you're getting, uh, and, and things like that. Finally, if, if you want to build, and like in the example I'm showing you, that's what I'm using, Google Sheets, another free uh, tool. And there's an analytics add-on that you can use on, uh, on Google Sheets to pull data from Google Analytics and build a, a uh, really impressive uh, report that uh, gets all the data that you need in one place. So when we're talking about the report, uh, I, I would say the most important thing is to, to, to think about your content through a funnel. So create a funnel uh, just, just for your content marketing uh, that you know, lets you imagine how people go from never heard of you to I want to pay you money. Um, and just think about the stages that it takes for someone who is completely oblivious of your brand uh, before he or she becomes a customer. Uh, most often, the, the, those stages that are C are, you know, first someone is just, uh, you know, uh, it's the new traffic that you get to your website. Uh, that is someone who's like non unaware of your brand. Um, then someone becomes a lead, when, usually when they give you your email. Uh, then uh, as you have some interactions with them and they show some interest in what you're providing as a service or a product, they become a prospect. And finally, you turn them into customers when they start paying you for that product or service. Uh, so when you're creating a funnel, you know, going back to those KPIs I was talking about earlier, uh, think of what what is the KPI that you can use to, you know, to, to tie to that particular step in the funnel? So in, in the case of traffic, that could be sessions, unique visitors, how many returning uh, visitors you have, that's, you know, that's uh, something that shows engagement. Um, in the case of leads, uh, it could be like the emails that you collect, because every email is a lead. Uh, and that c can be done using goal conversions, something I'll show you in, in a second. Uh, for prospects, it can be pricing page visited or how many trials have been started. And then finally, for customers, um, it's how many sales you get. And um, you know, for someone between a prospect and a customer, that doesn't mean they go out of your content funnel. They're still in the content funnel, and you're still using content to turn that prospect or that lead into a customer. So there's, there's a lot that you can do at that stage to, you know, 
push that person into uh, or earn their trust and turning them into a customer. So it, it doesn't end at the point where they give you their email. Content can be used after that as well. Um, as I said, uh, Whoopra works great for funnels. Uh, it's a really uh, great tool to use to set up a funnel in a visual way. And it also gives you a lot of, it collects quite a lot of information about the people who come to your website. So you can use that to you know, really build a profile of what people are doing on your website and use that data to um, take other actions. So if you know someone has visited your pricing page, for example, but haven't started a trial, and you have their email, you can send them an email saying, OK, why don't you try a free trial? Maybe you, know, maybe you saw our prices, but there's still like the two-week free trial that you can do. And it, like, it allows you to really get deep you know, get really deep with your customers and, and do specific actions with them. Uh, when you're building your report, it could, you, you know, you, it can start really simple, just as a, as a custom dashboard. Those screenshots look really grainy, I don't know. Uh, just build a custom dashboard in Google Analytics, if that's all you need at the moment. Just, uh, it allows you to collect all the uh, most information, uh, the most important data that you need on them. So f here, for example, I have you know all the sessions, just the SEO traffic because uh, that uh, particular client I was working for needed. You know they were really looking at SEO. Uh, then on the right hand side we have go go conversions, so we knew how many leads we gen generated during that period. So we put this on a custom dashboard uh, in Google Analytics, and we were looking at it. But if you want to build something more robust, more <coughs> complex, you can use uh, Google Spreadsheets with that add-on I mentioned, and like do as much as you want. So here we were pulling data from, from Google Analytics, uh, putting it in a spreadsheet, um, and, and, and doing a lot of extra analysis with that. Just some of the things that uh, I think are important to consider when you're um, doing your report. Attribution uh, is, is one of the important things um, because you want to know and, and you want to have a good idea of how you count where a particular customer is coming from. So you should know, for example, someone might have seen a blog post and an ad on Google if you're doing Google Ads. And you want to have an idea for yourself of how, like, how you're going to attribute that that uh, sale. Uh, so, did it come from your content, or did it come from the ad that you placed on Google? Uh, setting up uh, goals in Analytics and Whoopra, um, and of course, you know how to uh, measure your data in in a way to avoid, you know, issues with the data spikes if you get a like a viral post or something like that. Uh, so, I don't know if, like, if you have an idea of UTM links, but it's just b basically adding uh, certain parameters to the link that you're using, which gives you information about uh, where that visitor ca came from. Um, there's a lot of information online on how to use UTM links. Uh, no, you can just research that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that much time to go into that much detail. But for example, here, uh, you know, um, this example just shows several different types of banners and uh, call to actions that we used on a blog. And by using QTM links on them, we were able to see which one works best. For example, here we have text links or just simple links that we placed uh, within the blogs. Uh, and they work much better than all the other um, uh, call to actions that we were using. So banners were getting very few clicks and, and so on. Uh, setting up goals in Google Analytics, again, it would probably be easier to do it if you go online and research. But uh, you know, just, just to show you how, it's, uh, how to do it, just go to the admin, set up a new goal, um, give your goal a name. So, for example, in this case, we had an email course. So, people who signed up for the course, we signed, uh, we, we counted as email course conversions. 
And um, we had a thank you page where people ended up uh, after they signed up for the email course. <coughs> and we set the URL of, the, of that thank you page as the destination. So every time someone landed on that page, because the only way they could reach that pa page was through signing up for the email course, every time they landed on that page, it counted as a goal conversion. And that's, uh, that, th those were the goal conversions that you saw on the custom dashboard earlier. Uh, finally, in, in this section, you know, looking at thinking, again, strategically about how you look at data. So this is a simple comparison between two periods uh, for that same client. Um, so the first one, you know, is uh, uh, the beginning of uh, 2015, the, f the first half of 2015, and the second period is the second half of 2015. And if you just look at that, it doesn't look so great. I mean, it's like quarter uh, traffic is. Uh, almost 26% down, you know, most things look down. But when you look at the data more closely, you know, you see that there was a certain spike uh, in uh, like at the end of the first period and that's when one uh, blog post went viral on uh, Hacker News and um, basically they got a huge spike in, in data. So for this particular client, something that we did was to start to look at uh, traffic at three months averages, uh, with the you know with the looking back three months and just taking an average of the three months, which kind of flattened out the, the spike a little bit. So it allows you to you know it gives you a better idea of uh, how you're reporting and how you're looking at data, and it shows you with uh, you know that would still uh, show as a spike in traffic, but not as big as what we saw just by looking month month to month. Okay, and. Uh, just to wrap up at the end of this, uh, let's discuss a little bit how to ca actually calculate return on investment. It really gets down to knowing two numbers. Uh, one is the cost of acquiring a customer, and the other, the other one is uh, the lifetime value of that, of that same average customer. Um, to find out your uh, CAC or cost of acquiring a customer, Here's a simple cal calculation, uh, quite simplified, really. So let's say that in last month you got four clients and you spent uh, 1,200 pounds on producing content. 800 of that was spent on getting four posts written by freelancers. Uh, and it took you 10 hours to edit those, get them on your blog, you know, get source images, do SEO optimization and all that. Um, and I'm mentioning that here because it's really important to add up, you know, and to calculate everything that you put into producing content, even if it's your own time, because otherwise that's time that you can spend working on, working for clients and ge generating revenue for yourself. So think about everything that goes into producing clients, <laughs> even if it's your own time. Uh, and finally, you spend 100 pounds on tools, you know, Hosting, that really isn't the reason to spend more than 100 pounds, and even that is probably quite high. Uh, so, you spend 1200 to gain four clients, so you know each client costs you around 300 uh, uh, pounds to get. And then, calculating uh, lifetime value is quite similar, it's just the, the average deal size you get from a customer but it really depends on the industry that you're operating in. So if you're doing something like SaaS uh, or productized consulting or something like that, it's just the, the average rate that you get from your clients. So you take all your clients, you know how much each one uh, pays you, you take the average of that, and, just, and then you just multiply that by the average time that, uh, that you keep a customer. So if, if it's three months, you just take the average monthly, multiply by three, and, and so on. Uh, but if you're doing something like freelancing and you're working, you know, building websites for clients, just, you know, looking historically, look what's the average uh, that a client has paid you for, for that service. And then compare the two. Obviously, if uh, you're generating less than you're paying, 
that's that's not a great thing. If you're getting more for, for from customers that you than you pay to acquire them, that's better. But if you're just generating one pound above that, you know it's probably not so great. Um, so a good rule of thumb that I've seen used uh, is just getting three times the cost of acquiring a customer, because at that at that level, you know it, you have enough to uh, produce the the product or the service and actually make some profit for for your business as well. Uh, most of that stuff, so more details and you know the screenshots actually looking as they should be, you can uh, get at that uh, that post. That's uh, the client I was referring to. Um, that that's a link, so you can just click it if you access the the slides. Uh, and before I finish, I mentioned the newsletter that I was talking about. So if you're interested, uh, you know, I try to collect only the most actionable uh, resources on content marketing. So not like people talking in general, you know, thought leadership, although that's great too. But actually, uh, guides and detailed tutorials on how to get stuff done. So how to set up goals, how to write an ebook, how to produce a video, things like that. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions now or after we finish outside. So feel free to come and uh, speak to me. Uh, and also happy to take any comments or criticism. Uh, feel free to use my uh, Twitter handle as well and just uh, tweet me what you thought of, uh, of that and if you have any additional questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that. Very good. Uh, okay, so have we got any questions? Well, I'm gonna. You were tentative, weren't you? We'll go here. Hi. Um, I've had an issue with um, traffic spikes, which have been caused by spam referrers, things like uh, fake Google and motherboard and various other weird names. Have you um, seen that issue? And what's your, what's your advice? I think you can you can do filters and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I've seen that. I haven't de dealt with it uh, personally, but I've seen it affect uh, websites. Um, I guess in the beginning it's, uh, it's kind of hard to just, uh, especially if you're running a site that gets a good amount of traffic, it's usually hard to find out about it before it's too late. But if, I would say the best way to deal with it is just filtering. And I think uh, Google Analytics allows for that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it's done, but I, I, would, say, I would suggest just researching online and, and getting it done. Thanks for that. Hands up if there's another question. I'm sure there's somebody brimming. Need a little confidence push. There we go. <laughs> um, like many people I've found online, um, I have a problem using Google Analytics with WooCommerce. It doesn't track the same revenue. I don't know whether you've ever used WooCommerce uh, with Analytics or whether anybody in the room has used it successfully and if this problem is overcomable. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't used it personally, but I've seen, I've, I've had to use uh, Google Analytics with other, uh, like other tools that were tracking uh, sales internally for a company. Um, my suggestion would be to find out like what's the source that you trust the most. So maybe it's WooCommerce, I would, I would, I would guess. And just uh, uh, use that as, as your baseline. So if, if you have to pull data, data about visits from Google Analytics, but compare that to your sales, like the revenue that you get from WooCommerce, <laughs> and just decide on what you'll be using going forward as the most accurate source of data. <laughs> Um, the answer on that, there's, um, I think there's a plugin extension that um, helps with that. And also there's an analytics e-commerce setting. You can track different stages of the uh, checkout to measure those things. And um, if you go to measurementschool.com, there's a video on how to explain how to filter that. So have a look. We're very ahead of schedule, so don't feel shy. If you, it's a little bit technical question, but are you concerned in any way that um, Google Analytics and Wupra are JavaScript-based tracking tools, and uh, 
at this point in time, a lot of people are using um, extensions of a browser to simply block all those tools, and that your report doesn't really represent real traffic. I think that might be the same problem. It's the JavaScript process that might be the problem. Uh, of course, that's you know that's an issue that uh, sh should be addressed. Um, and I'm sure the people at Google HQ and, and Whooper are thinking hard about it and how to, to overcome that. But, uh, you know, even with that, you, you're still getting, I mean, even the data if you're getting in Google Analytics, if you're running a large site with lots of traffic, you're still getting a sample, you're not getting the full data. Uh, so even when you have people blocking the, um, the the trackers, you still the the data you get from the people who don't block the trackers, it should still give you enough information about what users are doing and how they are, you know, what their behavior is. I uh, work at a large organization and I'm in content marketing, producing content mainly. My organization won't let me see the analytics won't let me have a tracking campaign of my own. I'm not allowed to give out coupon codes at events when I speak. How can I do guerrilla tracking of my effective effectiveness? <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, one of the ways is just so one thing I do is after these events, like the reason why I ask people for, to tweet me, for example, it, it gives me a, an idea of how engaged the audience was. So, and I've, I've had really good comments from people, you know, on Twitter especially. Um, another thing I do is I look at the analytics on SlideShare to see how many people actually open the slides after the conference. So there's some, you know, some hacks, some, some shortcuts, but I don't think you can do content marketing meaningfully if you're not looking at analytics. So my suggestion would be to, I don't know, go and talk to your boss or something like that. A little bit of an easier question here. How did you get started and why did you choose content marketing over something else? Uh, so I got started with content marketing because I've been blogging for, for a long time. You know, I was that, uh, that person at the beginning, the uncool content marketer. <laughs> Uh, and I got started by freelancing at first, just started with writing, and then from writing, I, you know, I uh, had to learn how to write in a way that produced results, and then how do you set those, those results, uh, so then you get to the point where you get to decide what the results should be, so you get to the strategic level, so you start, you know, it's a lot of, I would say, a lot of reading, a lot of research online, reading online, um, subscribing to a lot of blogs that, that talk about that, uh, and then doing it, starting with writing, then editing, then doing the technical stuff, you know, SEO and all that, uh, setting up blogs, setting, setting up landing pages, setting up funnels inside your analytics tool, and then getting to the strategic level where you decide how to move all the pieces and how to arrange them. Hi, uh, do you have any experience with guest bloggers and how to leverage all their followers? Um, they can work really well, uh, but they have to be invested in, in writing for you. Uh, and there are many people who will reach out and they will say, can we write a guest post? Uh, and usually if you say, like, it really depends on how you set up the, the relationship. So what we did with that same customer help staff, we had a, um, guidelines about guest blogging, so we asked people to write a really like between 1,500, 2,000 words uh, to get it published, like really new, not published before, uh, you know, not something just rewritten from their own blog or something like that, and that can work really well. And people who have large audiences, uh, they will really go out of their way to promote their content because they've already put all the effort in producing it for you and it's usually if it's something that's long and detailed and new, they need to put a lot of effort to produce it. So they will go out and, uh, <clears throat> and, and promote it to their, to their audience. Uh, you can also run um, um, just a topical campaign about guest blogging. 
something we did with the same customer was we ran a, a remote work month uh, campaign where we asked about, I think it was 20 people or so to produce guest posts on, on that topic of remote work and how they do it for themselves. You know, they were mostly remote workers and people who run remote companies. And that had, you know, that generated buzz in itself. We had a, a Twitter hashtag and people were using it when they were sharing their content. So it's, uh, it generated a good, you know, good level of uh, popularity. Um, do you see any difference in the analytics between long posts, short posts? What type of average word, number of words in a post do you think works really well? And also posts with videos, do you see any difference in engagement between those and posts without? Or What sort of things do you add to, in terms of actual content mm -hmm. to make posts more viral? Right. Um, there, there's always a difference between long posts and, you know, especially short posts. Uh, and really long posts, there's always a difference. Uh, there's also lots of research done that's been published online that you can see that long posts perform generally better. Um, you know, the, the, for most competitive keywords, what ranks uh, on the first page of Google is usually between 1,500 and 2,500 words. But it really depends. You know, it really depends on the niche that you're working in. It really depends on what you're doing. It really depends on your audience and what they're expecting. You know, my guess is if you are creating something for teenagers, probably they won't respond that well to a 2,500 uh, post. Video might work a little bit better. <laughs> so I would just suggest, you know, uh, I can think of uh, blogs that have um, 30 or 35 posts in total. Each of them is. 5,000 words long, and they do really well. And then I can think of uh, someone like Seth Godin who writes 200 word posts, and he's also performing phenomenally. So it really depends on, on what you want to achieve with it. Hi. Um, so I work with a lot of uh, small, independent high street businesses, and they're quite often interested in blogging and getting up in the SEA rankings. Um, the, the big challenge, I guess, is what you've just outlined, which is um, to get high up on the rankings, you need two and a half thousand words, et cetera. What's, what's your advice for small businesses? Because you know, if they're busy during the day and they don't, they don't necessarily have the time to, to write this, this length of content, so is there a, is there a hack for, for the small, independent high street business? Actually, I think it, it, content marketing works great for small businesses. Uh, one of the reasons is that very few of them are doing it, so it's not that noisy. Uh, you know, for example, if you use content marketing in, in digital marketing, that, that space is incredibly noisy, so everyone's pumping out content. But for small businesses, it's, it's not so noisy. And the people who run small businesses are usually experts on what they do, so they have a lot to share with, with uh, with their audience, and it could be a you know a way to generate uh, a lot of new business. Um, in terms of time, yes, I, you know I know people are very busy, but everyone needs to be doing some kind of uh, uh, of marketing, and it's it's a way to to do it in a very cheap and scalable way. Yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, I mean, to give you an example, you know, I worked with recently with a wine shop, and they have amazing, ex incredible expertise. They they do struggle with time because they're just so busy. Um, one of the hacks they came up with was just reposting their news their newsletter, and making sure that was blocked sorry. Out. Can you, can you speak up? I can't hear you very well. Sorry, um, I was going to say. Uh, so one of the clients I worked with recently was a wine shop, and they've got incredible expertise. Um, they're just busy, literally. You know, staffing their their shop during the day. Um, I guess one of the hacks they came up with was, you know, they they produce a newsletter for clients and they've started posting that out on their blog. Um, I was just, I guess, looking for other useful, practical mm -hmm. tips that you might have because I think the the expertise is definitely there. It's just about the okay, what can they be doing on a practical level to, you know, to do it? Because I, honestly, I think I know what you're saying about the the two and a half thousand words and the expertise and people are, are not doing it, but I just don't think they have the time, so. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And, and that's, a, that's a very valid uh, question. So I would say the first thing is just once they see that it works, they'll find the time, I'm sure. So the trick is to, you know, to get it to, to work for, 
for a little bit. Uh, so one, one piece of practical advice I can give you is just get them to record a video or, or even an, like a short audio clip uh, and get someone to transcribe it. I mean, uh, go to Upwork or whatever, get someone you know, who speaks very good English to transcribe it for, like the cost can be very low to get that done. There are even services that you can just send a clip and they'll send you back the transcription of that clip, get it published. Uh, and you know, set up set up that whole structure that I was talking about earlier, just to show them that how it can work for them, how it can generate footfall, how it can generate sales if they're selling online, um, and do that. Uh, another thing, get them to record some videos and put them online. Um, I'm I don't know if there's anyone in this room who hasn't heard of uh, Gary Vee. You know, the, the, he's a famous. Uh, American entrepreneur, but he actually started in wine. So he was uh, recording videos, you know, doing reviews of wines, comparing different styles of, styles of wines, talking about, uh, you know, what glasses to use for wine and things like that. And that's, that actually worked really well for his business. I mean, he used video content marketing exclusively, and I think his business went from like just the wine business went from 5 million a year to 30 million a year or something like that. Um, so just show them, you know, find easy ways uh, to do something small, get started with something small, you know, prove that it works, show them how it can work, and I'm sure they'll find the motivation themselves. Okay. So it's your videos of you drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much for all those uh, answers. I think that was just as useful to get all that Q&A as the talk, uh, the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you.